shakalaka, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters around the world. You ready for it? This is going to be an epic podcast. We got Chris Shul up in here, a.k.a. the Esoteric Noetic, a.k.a. the Bitcoin MC. And you know I'm talking about the Bitcoin Cash when I'm talking about Bitcoin. We are about to interview the Beach Boys. These guys are pretty much the, uh, I would say, the, the poster boys of the Bitcoin community. They have a podcast called The Beach Boys that you should definitely check out. And they disseminate truth bombs in regards to what's going on in the world of Bitcoin, in regards to the technology, in regards to the, the development, in regards to the philosophy, which is something that so often gets overlooked, which we're going to get into on this episode of the Crucial Journey podcast. And we're going to spend the next hour to two talking about what's been going on in the realm of Bitcoin. As you are probably aware, we recently had the CoinGeek conference, a powerful conference. I just listened to the Vinamani Marnie podcast, and he had the pleasure of actually presenting at the CoinGeek conference and spoke about just the, the energy, the synergy, just the, the feeling of empowerment that is perpetuating the Bitcoin Cash eco space, if that's even a word. And uh, I wanted to get into just some of the things that came about through the CoinGeek conference speak about the philosophy of Bitcoin Cash, speak about liberty, speak about philosophy, and drop it all up into this beautiful podcast. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, start off by just giving you guys an, an intro into the CoinGeek conference. I think this will pretty much sum up what this whole thing was about. So buckle up as we get the show underway. Boom shakalaka. Blockchain Bitcoin, two words that have certainly shaken the entire globe in the last few years. Today in Hong Kong, we are witnessing the dawn of the new era with Bitcoin Cash. As we connect the dots between BCH and e-commerce to give merchants, miners and investors the competitive advantage over rising competition. My name is Stephanie and welcome to the very first CoinGeek.com conference. The inaugural event set a one-of-a-kind conference for Bitcoin and commerce communities from all over the world. We went for kind of like a VIP lounge kind of ambiance that's sort of differentiate us from some of the other events that's, that have gone on. But the real point of the event is to start spreading the message about how Bitcoin and specifically Bitcoin Cash, which is the only Bitcoin, can be used for merchants and create economic freedom for the great unbanked of the world. Innovators. Pioneers, you are the future of B. The recent protocol upgrade last May 15 now enables the creation of ICOs. Ji and Hu shared his optimism on these coins within this blockchain. I believe the majority of the financial assets uh, exist in the blockchain will not be ICO tokens anymore in the coming five to ten years. Uh, and Bitcoin Cash uh, should uh, develop its uh, programming languages, its scripting languages to support such kind of assets. If we can uh, do it uh, correct and fast, uh, Bitcoin Cash will win the future of a crypto economy. And to take part in this revolutionary economy, thought leaders gave the steps on how merchants and consumers alike can start integrating Bitcoin Cash into businesses and their daily lives. First, I would tell a merchant, there's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing bad is going to happen. You can accept Bitcoin Cash, and even if you're afraid of volatility and like the Bitcoin Cash price, you can have it immediately converted. So there's nothing bad that's going to happen. The only thing that's going to happen could be good. It may take a while, but Bitcoin Cash will grow in usage. You'll attract. Most importantly, you'll be at the cutting edge. Do you want to be a follower or do you want to be a pioneer? Tell your friends, tell your family, tell every business you frequent, hey, start accepting Bitcoin Cash, start using Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash is money for the world and it brings more economic freedom to every single individual in the world. If you're using censorship to either protect or promote what's supposed to be a censorship resistant money, you've missed the entire point of Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, censorship and bad people are never going to stop doing bad things anywhere in the world. So it's up to our job to build tools that just kind of make them irrelevant. To make things even more exciting, Dr. Craig Wright introduced the atomic age of Bitcoin. Well, we're already starting to work on building it and we're going to slowly be putting it, uh, these into different releases. People can start themselves now. The difference is right now people can start building this technology, but it'll be simpler and simpler over time. So today we can do it, but we want it so that my grandma can do this. We want simple coders, young kids to build new applications and organizations. So it's a little way from that because we have to dumb it down a lot first. We have to make it so that you click something and the library works. You can do it now if you're 
really, really good and smart and a really great developer. Or shortly, when we release the, um, the simple libraries for this, you'll be able to do it just as a front-end developer or something like this. You'll be able to point these libraries in and, and keep going. To learn more about Bitcoin's atomic age and watch other exclusive videos from the conference, subscribe to CoinGeek.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to give you guys an intro into Bitcoin, the CoinGeek conference, what this whole thing is about. It's about peer-to-peer -peer cash, not some form of digital storage. <laughs> it is about trying to empower the world. And I, I feel like uh, the CoinGeek conference really paints the, the, the right attitude about Bitcoin. So uh, kudos to the CoinGeek people. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I think I've kept the, uh, the Beach Boys waiting long enough. Let's get down and talk about Bitcoin and proselytize the Bitcoin cash. All right, let's do it, yo. Boom shakalaka. How are you all doing? How's it going? Hello. Good. Good to see you? those sexy smiles of yours, guys. Sorry to keep you guys waiting. Just no wanted to, uh, to paint the picture of... Uh, What's been happening over the last few weeks? There's, there's been a lot that's that's transpired since um, I think I listened to both of you guys. Uh, I know that uh, you guys have been busy doing your own things. Uh, what's been happening in your world? Let's let's talk about. I guess I, I guess I'd like to spend the next uh, just a few moments trying to get to know you guys individually. You guys have been doing this podcast, the Beach Boys podcast, which primarily focuses on proselytizing Bitcoin Cash. And I'm curious to hear your story, how you guys got together. Uh, where you guys come from, your background. So, lay it out for us, guys. How'd you guys get together? What's your story? Yeah. Uh, we're, uh, we're actually uh, long-time friends, uh, long-time high school buddies, um, and recently just kind of got involved in the space a little, little bit, started paying attention. Um, last summer, I would say, is like when, for me at least, when I started to really get into uh, cryptocurrencies, and blockchain and everything. And uh, originally kind of liked Ethereum. Like I'll, I'll admit it, <laughs> I, uh, I liked Ethereum uh, to start off. I thought the whole smart contract capabilities were pretty important um, for uh, kind of the future of where we're going. And until uh, Bitcoin Cash came around, that's when um, I started to really do a deep, deep dive into the whole system. And uh, I don't know, you might be, I don't know, for yourself, uh, once you kind of go down that rabbit hole, you start to go deeper and deeper and deeper, and it's pretty hard to get out of it. Um, you just start watching YouTube videos, um, reading different articles, um, looking more into the history of the space too, um, which we've kind of gone, looked into and uh, discussed in one of our podcasts recently, you know, The Road to Serfdom, where we, uh, we really took a deep dive into what's happened to Bitcoin Core and the history of it. And it's Absolutely. kind of a shame that it had to happen. That was an amazing uh, podcast, by the way. I, I really appreciated that because you guys went into something that I really appreciate. I think it's something that doesn't really get uh, discussed enough in the, the whole Bitcoin world, which, which is the philosophy, the economics of, of this entire thing. A lot of people forget that Bitcoin Cash is not just a cash system or a form of digital storage or whatever you might think it is. It's a form of economics. And you guys obviously come from – I'm curious to ask is – as people come into Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies from, from different backgrounds, I mean, some people are interested in making money. I think we all are. Some people uh, are, are coming from this kind of like libertarian angle. Uh, what was the background that kind of, what, what was it exactly that drew you guys to Bitcoin? Was it just the, the fascination? Do you guys just hear about the technology and you're like, I want to adopt this? Or do you guys have some kind of your own guiding philosophical uh, thing that's kind of pushing you towards wanting to uh, achieve the whole Bitcoin uh, objective. I can, I mean, I can say for myself, mm -hmm. I, so I first read about Bitcoin in late 2013. And uh, I guess when that bubble kind of, you know, the Mt. Gox and all that kind of stuff, I really first heard about it <clears throat> reading about the Silk Road. Sure. So that was kind of interesting to me that there was this giant underground world of commerce occurring uh, with Bitcoin. Um, you know, ironically, I actually, I, I had looked at Reddit, you know, and you saw the, even at that time, 
the our Bitcoin stuff was happening with all the censorship and all that stuff. Um, so I actually was convinced back then that a fork was imminent. And so I was actually waiting for the fork to happen and it didn't <laughs> for a very long time. Um, but so I guess for me, I, I was, I guess became interested in, in Bitcoin, right? You know, the main reason, obviously at that time too, you, you had already known about WikiLeaks trying to use it to, to get around a banking blockade. Um, and then, and then, you know, I never used the Silk Road, but to see that people were engaging in free trade, uh, that's, that's pretty interesting just that it was happening and, and no one could stop it. Um, but I guess for both of us, we're probably both very libertarian leaning. Uh, yeah, I noticed that. And that's, I guess that's what I was wanting to get into because it, it's, it's, you strike me as people that, uh, I mean, granted you guys have gone into this thing recently, like myself, as far as like, um, you know, both feet in the water going at this. But I feel like you guys have obviously, you guys have a sound understanding of economics, like the books that you recommend, uh, the, it just seems as if you guys are obviously people that are, like I've always kind of um, had that vision in mind, or is it something that's just developed over the last few months? Uh, for me, I, I honestly would be ashamed of some of the opinions I had just a year ago with respect to economics and, and, and things like that. So Yeah, well, for that, me, that means you're growing. Join, join the crew, bro. I mean, there were, <laughs> not that long ago, I was, you know, I was, I was saying the exact opposite of uh, the arguments I generally make. You know, I was talking about talking to one of my very capitalist-minded friends and saying, "Oh, you're you're greedy, man. You you're greedy capitalists and all that kind of stuff." And then, not really knowing what capitalism is, uh, this is about five years ago, and just over the last while, I've I've really been educating myself on the economics of things, and I think it's um it's it's a sign that you're you're evolving. You know, when you do change your opinions, if you're the same person. If you have the same opinions uh, as you did five years ago, it really means that you haven't learned that much, in my opinion. Yeah, I definitely agree. And for me, just kind of elaborate too. Uh, I and I really focus on accountability. I really, I don't. The accountability aspect of Bitcoin Cash is what kind of triggered me to kind of go down the rabbit hole. Um, I think when you have a finite currency um, that can't be produced at just the whim of anyone's hands. Um, I think that's very important economically. And so I think that the whole point of Bitcoin Cash is to add accountability uh, to people's actions, um, the way that they work, the way that they function. And that rolls up to enterprise level as well. Um, keeping companies honest. Companies have to manage their risk appropriately. Um, you can't really get these bailouts per se, you know, because uh, when there's a finite amount of something, you know, there's a little bit more risk that you have to manage and uh, you can't really get any handouts. So that's kind of for me, the accountability aspect of Bitcoin is what really, really triggered me to go down the rabbit hole pretty deeply. Absolutely. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I mean, my entire uh, drive towards Bitcoin cash pros proselytizing has been that uh, I'm a libertarian, uh, volunteerist, if you want to call it that. And I just love the whole I idea, the, the moral philosophy behind it. A lot of people come to, I think, libertarianism through the understanding of economics. I kind of went the other way around. Like, uh, I've always read a lot of philosophy, and it was only recently that I started learning more about Austrian economics and then learning about central banks, learning how the whole thing works, learning about how your, your, your money is devalued over time through central banks. And essentially, when you have a system of sound money like Bitcoin Cash, it addresses a lot of the problems. I mean, central banks are essentially a tenant of communism. And when you, anything, in my opinion, that kind of like moves away from that stuff, puts back the, the hands of, in, the, the rights into the hands of the individual is definitely a good thing. And the fact that Bitcoin and cash is allowing that, allowing people to have control over who they can interact with, uh, getting the governments out of it, that's definitely a positive thing for me. And I often hear you guys... Um, speak about i mean i've gone through all your podcasts really admire what you guys do you you guys in my opinion are uh, are a really uh a really championing the ideas of bitcoin because when i i would hear about bitcoin from the you know people like people that were actually involved in this from the from the onset i i, I only adopted bitcoin as far as actually getting bitcoin recently but i'd often hear about people that were trying to separate economics from from the state i'd hear about these people that had these libertarian 
values that are essentially trying to liberate the world, create more economic freedom, therefore um, will essentially just benefit the world. And the same values that I think um, I would hear about I've I've seen perpetuated within your your podcasts, you know, the the way that you guys talk about the philosophy, the even even into the technology like a lot of people think that Bitcoin cash, Bitcoin has nothing to do with philosophy. And the more that you learn about it, the more when you understand the technology. I mean, I come from a an IT background, soft, software engineering, and you start seeing the philosophical aspects of this, everything being linked to uh this this idea of individual rights, just the way that I find People within the the Bitcoin core community tend to think tend to see Bitcoin as opposed to the Bitcoin Cash community. You realize that there is an underlying philosophical uh, basis for this, uh, whether it's the economics or whether it's just the moral philosophy behind it. And I really like how you guys go into that. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys: now there are a lot of cryptocurrencies out there. Obviously, we're aware of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core. That's the that's the one that most people refer to as Bitcoin. And uh, you guys have adopted Bitcoin Cash, and I'm curious, what was it that led you to adopt? Why do you why do you guys feel that Bitcoin Cash is the best cryptocurrency? Because you guys are amongst the the biggest proselytizers, in my opinion. I've listened to a lot of people, and you seem to be very very strong on the on the idea of Bitcoin maximalism. That Bitcoin can essentially do anything. Well, do everything more so than all the other coins out there. And I'm in agreement with you. And I guess I I want to hear you guys make the argument for. Uh, why you think Bitcoin Cash is the uh, is is the king? I'll, Scalability. I'll <laughs> I mean, do you want to go? Do you want to go, Connor? I'll just say real quick. I mean, I'll say sure. Well, number one, thank you for your, your kind words. That's very nice. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, but I think it, it kind of goes back to everything you just said. Uh, Bitcoin is more of an economic system than it is a cryptographic system. That's that's a fact. It's uh, there's a, uh, I, might, I might have it with me. I'll, I'll see if I pull it out. But, and this is something uh, I first saw Craig Wright bring up. The he, he brought up Peter Weiner's book, Policing Online Games. And I just read that, what, a few months ago. And I, I know Corey's been reading it too. It talks about creating a security model around uh, online gaming using a chain of digital signatures, right? So it talks about using the equivalent of a blockchain to, to create digital currency inside of a game. Um, this is a book written in 2003, I think. And it definitely wasn't necessarily, I, I think the book had some original ideas, but it wasn't necessarily the first time that had been brought up. So what really makes Bitcoin work are, is the underlying economics of the system. And I, I'm sure we could uh, talk about how the economics of a lot of the other systems um, don't work. But I guess just for me, I, I'll give you a very economics. quick example. I just went to a presentation on uh, Decred from one of the lead developers. Yeah, I don't know about a lead developer, but a developer for Decred gave a presentation and they are a combined proof of work, proof of stake system, right? Uh, what he kept saying, you know, they talk about there's this, buzzword now blockchain governance that's what a lot of these other cryptocurrencies talk about how they they have this system of blockchain governance and what that actually means is a group of developers or master nodes or, or an oligarchic system in some fashion where the early people own a share of of the decision making process that means that if you are using their currency your ability to transact with that currency is dependent on that quote unquote governance model, right? And and there's absolutely nothing revolutionary about that whatsoever. Yeah, we've uh, seen that Bitcoin time and time works. again. Bitcoin works. I can, I can send you a transaction right now and I can be insured that that transaction will work because of the economic incentive system Satoshi Nakamoto created behind the proof of work system. So... I don't want to have to depend on on whatever the hell blockchain governance means. Absolutely, to make sure my transaction works. Absolutely, and I think this comes down to once again why Bitcoin Cash is, in our opinions, the the best uh, system. It's the economic structure. It's following the whole idea of capitalism, which is competition, which is a, a great technology for, for for benefiting individuals, and in my opinion, it promotes freedom. 
I mean, a lot of people think about um, capitalism as being very greedy, but essentially it it's fueled by self-interest. And I think one of the things that gets misunderstood with this entire uh, debate between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash is, well, the purpose of Bitcoin. And uh, I, I think it does come down to, uh, once again, philosophy, the fact that there are some people that obviously want to use this thing as a way of interacting peer-to-peer -peer cash uh, and others that, uh, at least when it comes to the, the policies that they want to apply, you know, they want to they want to move away from the capitalist model and adopt a governance model that is more in line with, with socialism. And one of the things I wanted to get into with, uh, with you guys, because I feel like this is one of the main things that's going on in the, uh, the, the ecosystem um, is just in regards to governance model. I mean, we recently had the CoinGeek conference, and no doubt you guys are, uh, have heard. I'm not sure if you guys follow Vin Armani, his podcast. Brilliant, really talks about this kind of stuff. You're obviously familiar with him because we, we got into a bit of a discussion a few weeks back in regards to, I guess, which governance model would be the best governance model. But in short, just to paint the scenario, Jihan Wu at the CoinGeek conference announced that, uh, I think he just suggested that it would be a, a great idea uh, to follow or to take lead from what some of the other cryptocurrencies like Dash are doing in, in the fact that they have a, a governance model that focuses on development that allows uh, the users to contribute, um, not necessarily voluntarily though, to, to areas of development and advertising. And if Bitcoin Cash is really going to compete and have that advantage, um, it, I, it's important for us to, to focus on taking care of our developers. And Vin Armani, a few weeks earlier, actually made a, a point kind of touching on that. I think he made the argument in regards to why he should only continue to keep Cointex on the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem. And we, w we went into this whole debate uh, in regards to which governance model would be best, Dash and whatnot. And I think one of the great things that emerged from Jihan Wu's talk was, I don't know exactly how it came about, but essentially he spurred the, the miners to come together to to find a way of contributing some of their mining rewards to uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem. And just this whole idea of, I guess, funding the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem through, uh, well, through a form. I mean, it's it's not tax per se in the, in the sense that it's obviously voluntary, but I think it's it's good, in my opinion, that obviously we've, uh, we've arrived at a way of funding things like development because it is important if we are going to grow this thing, if we are going to compete, to have um, a way of doing this that gives us that edge. And I think one of the reasons that Dash is doing really well at the moment is the fact that they have this governance model that allows users to um, to contribute and f takes care of their developers, keeps, uh, yeah, keeps the best the best people uh, incentivized to stick with their their cryptocurrency. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts in regards to governance model, in regards to what, I guess the Dash governance model, in regards to this whole proposition by Jihan Wu, which seems to be taking into effect at the moment. A lot of the miners seem to be coming together, and at least from what I, I, I heard from Vin Armani, it's something that we could be seeing in the, in the not-too-distant future, uh, uh, a system. And it, it's completely voluntary, from what I understand. So, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think it should a hundred percent, um, remain voluntary, um, because like dash, because the 10% reward goes to that DAO system, um, they can, with that 10%, they can only fund so many people, um, and they can only fund so many activities. Um, I think that kind of puts a limit on what they can do. Um, when you look at the grand scheme of things. Uh, in terms of the funding for the Bitcoin Cash developers, I I agree that you know developers should be um, should be paid for their services, but I think that should all be done by private enterprise, which is kind of the same whole capitalist um, thing that Bitcoin Cash is supposed to be about. Um, it should be done by private enterprise, and if the miners want to voluntarily put together a fund or hire certain devs. Um, I think that would be great, great for the ecosystem. But as long as it remains 100% voluntary, because if you put in a tax into the system where all of a sudden the reward or anything's going to this certain fund, um, I think it's very dangerous legally. Um, I don't, I'm not too sh sure on the legal aspect, but I've heard that you know this could potentially be ruled as a security. Um, so I think we need to be careful about that. Sure. 
And um, just in terms of like what what kind of limits that puts um, when you when you add that certain percentage that this certain percentage is going to go to f developers, um, I think that kind of puts a restriction on how many people can actually participate in um, in, well, and, and building on top of the Bitcoin cash chain. In the case of Dash too, on the flip side of that, if and I've heard conflicting things, but at least Vin says that the Dash Treasury Fund has to be spent. So yeah, that's a that's a problem. That's, that like, if yeah, if, if, kind of if so then those so then I always hear two things. So I hear one. So I hear some people say it doesn't have to be spent. It could always go to the miners, and therefore you know whatever else. Okay, number one, when you ever heard of a central governing board not spend a budget, right? That's the first thing okay number two uh well i guess i will mention it from what i've heard the entire agreement is voluntary but i think people like vin wouldn't at least from what i've heard from him because he really likes the dash model wouldn't mind if it was taken out of the the block reward in the protocol sure and um, that creates at least to me i mean where is uh cory mentioned that it's a legal issue uh i feel like the philosophical issue to me, that's that's even more important, which is whether or not this is actually taking on the uh, the scheme of like a communist system. And I, I know Vin made an argument in regards to this that where he thinks it's stupid that people look at the Dash model as being a tax in that it's, he looks at it as more of a, a voluntary business arrangement. It's like you have a, a you, you've taken on some kind of business endeavor with your friend and you both agree to give up a certain percentage towards funding the business. And... I, I mean, to me, at the end of the day, people that are entering into the, the Dash cryptocurrency, I mean, they they know what they're getting themselves into. So there is a choice. To me, it all comes down to choice. The fact that there are all these other different cryptocurrencies here, the more decentralized we can have a system where people can actually choose whether they, they want to take on this idea. At the end of the day, that's still in line philosophically with having a, a voluntary system, and even though the, the actual community itself may be based off of this uh, democratic notion. Uh, in the fact that we all, all the users get to give up this a certain amount of their money, which allows them to uh, to vote in some kind of a um, yeah, democratic way, if I understand m the model correctly. But yeah, to me, um, it just comes down to choice. The fact that people need to have the options there, otherwise we start seeing a lot of the same things that we've seen happen in regards to governments transpire. Well, and I think this, I think this touches back on your question as to why, you know, why are you a Bitcoin maximalist? It's because I'm fine with, I, I don't have a problem with people experimenting with a governance model like Dash, right? Mm -hmm. But do that on top of Bitcoin, because here's the thing. If, if you're someone in Africa or South America or anywhere that is impoverished who needs Bitcoin the most, right? It's not really up to you whether you're entering into like a Dash-like system. Really what's going to happen is, Bitcoin is going to grow, and, and obviously I'm, I'm talking about Bitcoin Cash, where they're going to hear about it. it. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you're going to have this effect of people using peer-to-peer -peer currency, right? If someone, if, if let's just say hypothetically Dash became the global currency, and, and which which would be better than the centralized you know fiat systems of of the world. Sure. These people that are entering into this this currency may not have any idea the the governance model. Most of these governance models takes hours to understand, to get explained to, True all that. that kind of stuff. Um, if the system inherently is not done, it, the thing about Bitcoin is it's set up in just this completely fair capitalist way. Absolutely, if, if you, anarchic structure. So, so I, I would say we should get everyone on Bitcoin. Everything should be built on top of Bitcoin, on top of a deflationary system. And then if you want to create a side chain on Bitcoin Cash, which is what all alts are going to be anyway soon enough, then that's fine. And, and you're welcome to have your Dash experiment. And if the state of New Hampshire wants to have Dash as its uh, state currency, that's 100% fine, right? Uh, and it can exist in this side chain way with Bitcoin. But uh, the reason why I do... I. I don't like the argument that it's a voluntary system and you join it. It's because if, mm -hmm. if your goal is to make a global currency, yeah, the people who understand how to run a command line interface on Linux, sure, yeah. they know what they're getting themselves into, right? But 
but the people who the need peer-to-peer -peer currency, yeah, it, they're not going to have any idea what the Dash governance model is in it or anything like that. You know I hear what, I mean? what you're like, saying, and it, and it comes down to, uh, well, I guess people being aware of what they're they're getting themselves into. And what, I'm in complete agreement with your approach. I mean, personally, I'd, I'd much rather follow this uh, Bitcoin Cash capitalistic model, knowing that you know if you if you do have a situation where um, you know the a certain amount of um, of uh, of of the mining uh, of the money that you get through mining is obviously given to, is given to, to towards the uh, the dash development forcing this form of tax ta taxation on all of the users you do have people that are within lesser communities that don't don't have that kind of understanding of of, of how bitcoin works and as you're saying obviously it where is you can still say that it's a choice as in they they should know what they're getting themselves into just not having that knowledge like you're saying, it creates a lot of problems. What I love about this entire conversation is it feels like at the moment we're entering into this um, this era that was there was the same era maybe a few hundred years ago with the founding fathers. Like I feel like the kind of conversations we're having now in regards to trying to map out a governance model, trying to find the best system for a society, uh, and having a look at all the other systems that have actually worked all the, the pros and cons and trying to come up with the best system. It's beautiful because when you study history and you have a look at the founding of the United States and the, the conversations that took place between the founding fathers, how they studied all these different uh, governance models even, like the, the, the Greek and Roman systems, the, uh, the, they found what worked and what didn't. I mean, all, the founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Jefferson, they were all students of, of history and they... They obviously had an understanding of liberty. In fact, I, I think they're, they're some of the, the best capitalists out there just based off of their entire philosophy. And uh, it's interesting because I feel like we're in the same period where many of us are ha – we're all having the same conversation, like how to actually map out the fairest and most, um, uh, most thriving ecosystem. And this has all been done in this virtual space of, of blockchain, but it's still – I feel like we're in that age right now, the age of – of discovering the best system to govern society, and I I stand that you know it is a system of free voluntary exchange, and I think Bitcoin That's Cash is the only cryptocurrency that is staying steadfast to those ideals at the moment. That's why I'm in line with Bitcoin Cash. That's that's really well said, and and I think what we should learn from history is that we shouldn't be trying to plan economically plan any of this, which which I think is. What really bothers me about a lot of these other cryptocurrencies is mm -hmm. we should – there's something – I mean something that no one talks about is uh, there's a quote that Satoshi had that it said like after version point one, the client or, or the protocol is done essentially, right? And, and I got to remember exactly what – Protocol is set in stone? Set in stone. Sorry. Set in yeah. stone. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there will become a point very shortly. I, I, from what I've heard in the next year, and I, I don't know, obviously development timelines change, mm -hmm. where we will reach Bitcoin 1.0, okay? And and what that really means is, you know, today, you can't actually physically create a block bigger than 32 megabytes. It, it's, it's actually limited by the the software that, that is written. You, you actually need to rewrite parts of the software to actually, uh, whereas before it was just a matter of kind of changing a few lines and, and, and that's overstating it a bit. But, it's yeah. Um, I think apparently you can go up to what? What do we? We recently had the upgrade, right? We're up at what are we up at? Thirty. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. We're at 32 right apparently, yeah. cha cha upgrading it to a particular point is pretty easy. But then I guess the point that you're uh, you're making reference to is that this there is a point where it's no no longer an easy thing. There are a lot of changes that need to be made in order to upgrade, and we are approaching that point, I guess. As and, far and that as that is um, right now. So oh, and, and so we'll that get thirty. To the point very shortly sorry we'll get to a point very shortly where uh really scaling is, is 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 done it's built into the protocol blocks will be able to get as big as they want so then the question is so right now i think having these uh decentralized open source competing clients is very important Let's say theoretically you could run bitcoin abc or, or bitcoin limited you know version whatever What should be happening after that, and this is built into the incentive model, and it's just something I don't think anyone's really, the biggest problem is miners, I don't think, understand their role in the system whatsoever. I, I think uh, we talked about it a little with, with Craig Wright when he 
first gave his presentation a month before the fork, it, it was like people were just like, they couldn't understand why miners had power in the network. It was very interesting that we were in 2017, that was still true. And all I want to say is that there will come a point where there's, if you're a miner, why would you not hire a developer directly to build your client to search the network faster, to propagate blocks faster, to eventually it's just going to become who can create more optimized software to propagate a block faster and to find a block faster. Because if you do that, you win. And, and Absolutely. Are, I, and I also there's like no that reason for you to really share that with other miners. There's no reason. So uh, eventually it should just become miners hiring developers and competing with the protocol development. Whether Absolutely. we want to fund app development, I guess is another question too. But, yeah, and I, I guess okay. that ties back into the whole capitalist mentality. I mean, I love the fact that this whole thing is based off of competition. And in order to create, uh, in order to win, you are driven towards getting the best developers, finding out how you can maximize your profits, which is going to boost the uh, the price of, well, the value of Bitcoin Cash, you know, rather than making these conscious decisions to try to figure out how you can force people to make the 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 system better for it to to achieve your own ends. This is kind of what I would call the uh, um, the ends justifies means approach that you find when you're moving into socialistic kind of thinking, you know. But this whole idea of competition, which is what I feel the Bitcoin Cash uh, system promotes, is at least theoretically going to lead towards creating the best system. And it just comes down to I guess which school of thought people tend to uh, uh, tend to support, you know. But I definitely, I mean, I think all the evidence points to this. When we've seen the most, the freest societies uh, economically, uh, they tend to bring about more prosperity. You have a look at the, the top nations, they, they have a lot more economic freedom. When You have a look at Hong Kong. I mean, we have the Coingi Conference. Hong Kong has got, I think, the most amount of billionaires in the world, and they've reduced the amount of regulations they have tremendously. I mean, this, this, this place was just set up with, um, you know, basically just the rule of law and uh, uh, a capitalist system and it was basically nothing to begin with. And over less than 100 years, I would think, it's grown into this thriving system. And the less regulations there are, people will naturally find ways of arriving at what's going to work. I think Vin Armani, um, Vin Armani made some really cogent arguments. And I'm thinking back to the, uh, the dialogue that was, was taking place between you guys in regards to why he believes the Dash model is... Uh, is going to be beneficial. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he kind of, I think what he was, I, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here and I'm probably going to butcher it, but he liked the idea that there is this conscious ability for the, uh, the uh, organism to make decisions on its, its development. Like you reach a, a limitation in his mind and I'm probably butchering what he was trying to say here, but the way that I understood it is that when you have a driving force, uh, some kind of like, like, uh, conscious aspect of the organism that is navigating it towards its its goals that is that has some advantages as opposed to leaving a system in and I, I would disagree disagree with this but leaving a system to uh, I guess pure anar anarchic uh, governance you know where people will naturally create what is best by purely following their self-interest rather than people c consciously deciding like a group of people, consciously deciding what's going to lead to the best if that makes sense like I, I feel like that's the main distinction between the the dash model and the bitcoin cash model in the one, one is leading it up to self-interest the other is leading it up to uh, a group of individuals deciding what is going to create the best system or like trying to figure out what's going to create the best future i think yeah. dash too uh Dash is trying to resemble a system that we already have lined up right now, currently. Like trying to adapt uh, cryptocurrencies into a system that we already have. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've learned in my journey with Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is completely different from anything that we've ever seen, really, in our in our t lifetime. Um, it's a truly capitalist system, truly competitive system, and I think that a lot of people don't appreciate that, and they're trying and not just Dash, I think you're seeing this in a lot of other different cryptocurrencies too, that they're trying to they're trying to bridge the gap between the system that we have now and cryptocurrencies. Exactly. And I think they're doing a rough time of actually bringing 
keeping cryptocurrency the way it should be, mm-hmm. Bitcoin the way it should be. And they're just trying to pretty much just build the layer on top of what the system is now Absolutely. on top of whatever cryptocurrency. And that's the problem that right? we see, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I think the, rec- the recent headline, uh, this just came about just a couple of hours, hours ago from the Bitcoin.com website. I think there's certain countries, I, I want to say Sweden, um, they're already trying to create a, 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 centrally, a central bank-backed uh, cryptocurrency. Like they've act, they essentially are creating their own fiat currency. And now granted, this has been done with, um, I think, with other cryptocurrencies. I think um, uh, Venezuela is already doing this. But they're already trying to apply the, uh, the technology of Bitcoin and apply all of, all of these current ideas that we have within our, our, our paradigm in regards to having it backed by a central bank, trying to uh, allow for regulations and all that kind of stuff, thinking that's going to improve it. And... I mean, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of Bitcoin. I mean, I think because people look at this right. thing in a very different way to many people. I mean, one of the reasons that I became um, uh, on side of the Bitcoin Cash community is because fundamentally, granted, look, uh, to be honest, we're all, we're, we're all in this on some level because we, we definitely want to benefit financially. It's great to uh, be able to put your time and energy towards something and obviously see that benefit you. But the, the philosophy that is underlying this entire community and what I see more, more often than not people promoting is this idea of of free voluntary exchange this idea of of individuals having the right to transact and not having the banks regulate them and then you find people like uh samson mal you know advocating for the government to regulate uh cryptocurrencies and trying to um (laughs) i think recently they uh oh i think mal recently tried to uh to set up some kind of uh um uh, attack on the Bitcoin.com website because they were uh, they were committing some kind of fraud in regards to the promoting of uh, a Bitcoin. Um, but more often than not, I, I see a lot of people trying to add these government regulations onto Bitcoin because they, they they're into this whole notion of the state trying to control people people's money and the whole idea of Bitcoin Cash is, is it's kind of like the Wild West and not in the Wild West from the sense that. People can do any kind of violence they want or anything like that, but people have a right to do whatever they want without people trying to convert, uh, to coerce them into behaving in whatever light they see they see fit. You know, it comes down to anarchy, individuals transacting freely without the power of the state, and uh, I think because people are so so caught up in this old paradigm, they're trying to find ways of 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 avoiding that, of, of disrupting that. And I feel like that's the, the generally the battle that's going on between Bitcoin ca- Cash versus Bitcoin Core and pretty much a lot of the other cryptocurrencies. I mean, it's people that are trying to apply the old world into the new world and those that are trying to be crypto savages. I mean, this is a term that I started using courtesy of Vin Armani, but essentially just living in a in an agora system, you know, away from the the power of the state. And, but, uh, and it, it, it's kind of interesting that I, I you know, we, we started talking about it at the very beginning, but I don't think the libertarian free market, uh, that sentiment has, is completely removed from, from the Bitcoin BTC community. It, it's not there. Exactly. I, it's almost impossible to find it on any of their censored forums. It's almost impossible to find it. Um, I, all that they have is putting like cypherpunk in their Twitter profile. And, and then we're supposed to just believe them that they like care about any of these ideals. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So. I find the more that you understand the philosophy, you know, be, be within socialism and communism, you understand the, the psychological traits the, of people that tend to support these ideas. I mean, people often say that Bitcoin has nothing to do with, uh, with philosophy or any of this kind of stuff. Why do you keep on bringing this whole kind of like voluntarist thing into it? But I see the kind of arguments that the people, many of the supporters of Bitcoin, BTC, tend to make. And they're in this communist mindset, you know? Like this whole idea that, oh, Roger Ver is a, is a fraud because he's, um, <laughs> he has a, uh, like he's doing all of these things that, in in my mind, are, p- are perfectly sound. I mean, for instance, there was a. Uh, I think people are often calling up Roger for, for having sold explosives. I mean, you know the whole idea in regards to Roger being a criminal, that kind of stuff. And I know people generally have that as being a horrible thing. And the fact is, I mean, they weren't technically explosives. I mean, they were. Uh, 
uh, pest control uh, firecrackers or something like that. But the idea of some simply selling explosives to, to people, that's considered to be an egregious thing. But from my mindset, I'm like, all right, so well, okay, so what? People have a right to defend themselves with explosives, you know? And, and granted, this is, more an ex this is a more extreme example. I mean, I can understand a lot of people hear that and think you're crazy, but when it comes to things like the centralization issue, issue I think this is a classic example. I think it's classic ANCAPs versus ANCOMs. You have a group of people that are saying, well, hey, let's restrict the choices of people because unless we do so, it's going to lead to a potential problem where the government can come in and uh, they can disrupt what's going on. The whole idea of increasing the block size, obviously it's going to cause miners to need more powerful computers and you're going to have a, 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 a bunch of people coming together with more powerful computers. It makes it easier apparently, theoretically, for the government to come in and disband Bitcoin. But it's all coming from this perspective of we need to put restrictions in place and limit the freedom of individuals in order to avert what could potentially arise. And this whole kind of... Um, Thinking is a trait you find within utilitarianistic thinking. I watch a lot of, uh, uh, I think it's Richard Hart, and I found I find this guy so fascinating because he was one of the first people I kind of um, uh, started listening to when I first started learning about Bitcoin. And look, like he's saying all the right stuff, understands all. The, but when it comes to the way that he thinks, and the guy is very very intelligent, you know, I give credit where it's due. But his entire thinking is always along the lines of game theory and trying to plan for the future. And his entire philosophical mindset is geared towards trying to restrict people to avoid problems. And this is, I think, why he has this whole idea of supporting BTC. He sees a lot of potential problems that are not necessarily there with Bitcoin Cash, but because he's so focused on trying to avert something from happening, like he focuses on the, the basic idea, the philosophy behind capitalism, you know, leave it to the in individuals, you know, trust in the free, free market, which is essentially just voluntary exchange. And eventually, uh, I mean, uh, by having, and it's not even faith, it's just first and foremost respecting in people's individual rights and yeah, just trying to create the best system within these limitations. And uh, I find more often than not, because Bitcoin has, has become this massive uh massive thing now you see the the general community ad which are obviously more socialist leaning perpetuating these socialist ideas and granted there there are definitely some voluntarists within the bitcoin community i find the voluntarists that actually understand the economics understand the technological side of it, the de development side of it um once they really get their hands on that they tend to understand why um bitcoin cash in my opinion is the better bet and uh I mean, I, I guess I want to address some of the arguments that we hear. Like, what, do you, what are the, some of the common arguments you hear against Bitcoin Cash? Because you must have heard them all at this point. I'm sure you get messages from people, Big Cash, Big Cash, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You guys are stupid. Why are you we supporting VCH? We, we have yet to get any negative, like, someone called us the bitch boys one time. That was okay. it. That's, the, that's it. <laughs> I think it's because you guys are so well-spoken and uh, so, like, you, you seem as like, you seem like gentlemen, you know, you kind of have that. Uh, shivers attitude about you. I haven't really seen you really go after anyone yet. I remember there was one time that you kind of like, um, I think you, I took issue with, um, I think one of the, car I can't remember who it was, but generally speaking, I think you guys have stayed away from really attacking people and calling him out, which is something the BTC crowd do to no end. You know, let's attack Roger Ver, let's attack, attack B Jihan Wu, let's attack anyone that um, is associated with, with Bitcoin Cash because Bitcoin Cash is evil. And uh, I respect that, man. I think it's hard to do that, particularly when you are passionate about something. But one of the things I would definitely like to see within the Bitcoin Cash community is people that are, stick to, like, actual facts. Like, I find a lot of people want to make all of these these woo arguments in regards to what people are doing, like Roger Ver is trying to do this and that. And for someone like me that tends to look at this whole thing and try to be as objective as I can, one of the things that... Um, I, I admire about you guys, and I see more often within the uh, the Bitcoin Cash community, is people that are doing their own research. Rather than buying into the conspiracies that are perpetuated by the, the masses, they try to understand what this whole thing is about, which comes down to the white paper. I mean, I, I recently listened to a debate um, in Brisbane um, between Bitcoin core supporters and Bitcoin Cash. Awesome debate. And... Uh, uh, one of the things that frustrated me is, look, we can come up with 101 reasons as to why we think Bitcoin is going to be better, or Bitcoin, BTC is going to be better than Bitcoin Cash or vice versa. Dealing with theory, dealing with um, theoretical aspects of economics, 
what people are going to do. And when it comes to that, I can't say anything definitively. But one of the things that I find the BTC su supporters often overlook is what Bitcoin was about. Like the whole idea of the white paper. I mean, it's obviously based off of um, cert, like a, a protocol. And people leaning towards this idea of defining Bitcoin. And I also, this is my own kind of subjective way of defining this. I find people, so, socialists tend to define things within a socialist mindset. Like a word is whatever it is that the majority decide it is. And when you, when you look at Bitcoin from that perspective and you say consensus determines what Bitcoin is. So if Bitcoin, BTC, changes to the point where it no longer follows the, uh, um, the, the economic uh, theory you know, that was set within Bitcoin, it's, it's added all of this ridiculous stuff like uh, you know, replaced by fee, the Lightning Network, SegWit, and it's, it goes on a completely different tangent not even resembling what Bitcoin was about. Well, the, because the majority of people support this now, that is Bitcoin, as opposed to defining it based off of an objective standard. And I think this is what leads to the whole divide between what Bitcoin is, because it comes down to how we actually define the protocol. And uh, I, I feel like, more often than not, this is the biggest issue in regards to how people look at Bitcoin. People have different ideas of what Bitcoin is. D is this something that you guys... Um, I can, have you noticed this this coming about as well? Like people have different ideas as to what concepts are, what Bitcoin is. One thing I've realized, like in the past eight months or so, is that mm -hmm. people really do not like when they're wrong about something, um, and they'll almost believe any other thing that makes them right. Um, and one in this case, you have people that are financially invested too. So on top of um, them not wanting to be wrong, they also don't want to be wrong when it comes to their finances as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why there's been just such a backlash uh, from the BTC core side is that people don't want to be wrong and they want to be part of this like cypherpunk movement and everything. Absolutely. And they'll almost go to believe anything that they're told um, in terms of like people that are popular in the system like Richard Hart, um, Tone Vase, like any big name um whatever they say that must be right um and they'll stand by that because they're on that that tribe you know i think we we have a huge tribal problem right now in the space absolutely um you're you're spot on that, you're spot on the fact that it, that people are financially invested i mean that, that's really what it comes down to no one especially if you're a big personality and you've made your career off of saying something if you are wrong i mean that your career is over, right? Um, I actually, I actually give. I think you, you might give more credit to some of the BTC people than I than I'm. I, I think that the reason why people are on the the BTC side of things mm -hmm. comes down to like two things, right? And number one would would be the economics of it, where either they don't understand the economics of the system or they just think the economics are wrong, so they they don't actually think that miners. Uh, competing in a capitalist system can work. I, I think that would be one side of it. Then the other side would just be the technical side where I think a lot of people want the idea of I run software on my computer, therefore I am part of this system to be true. And, and the, the thing is that was never supposed to be true. I don't know if those people have read the white paper or, or, or what. I, I mean, honestly, I, I know some of them think it's wrong. Some of them think what do we think the white paper should be written? And if that's the case, then, you, you know, you're not Bitcoin, right? Um, one, on, I, I think, <laughs> I don't think, I think that this is a solvable problem. I actually think that, and, and this is, I think, what we're trying to do. I, I think that no one has ever talked about the fact that this isn't this mesh network. This isn't a mesh system of, of, of everyone that, connects to the network means something in the system and then things route through you it, it what's really i think starting to really fascinate me and no one really talks about it is the topology of the network is actually i think more revolutionary than than anyone has given it credit for since uh 2008 when, when satoshi clearly actually knew at the time what what he was creating. He knew that he was creating a network that would have these small world properties. And uh, I think getting people to actually take a step back and understand that is our next 
task. I, I, I could be wrong that, that, that people care about that kind of stuff, but um, I, I think getting people to understand the power of the network, every other cryptocurrency is relying back on the same network the internet is built upon that they're not understanding that this is something different. And, and so if all we're going to do is, is create, you know, a mesh protocol where things route similar to the internet, and then you're just going to add the word blockchain on top of it, then you're not actually doing anything new. You're not actually, uh, you can say you are, but, but you're not really doing anything in my opinion, that would be revolutionary, which is what I think Bitcoin is. And, and so I think teaching people about that might help, but I, I could overstate how much people care about that. I'm, I'm not sure. I think you're right on the money and it does come down to education. I think the, the biggest impediment towards, uh, so many of the disconnects in regards to BTC, BCH, is the fact that this thing is such a complicated thing. And to me, it takes on the uh, the ideas of religion in a sense. I mean, when, when something becomes so complicated that um, it loses, uh, most people don't understand it. You know, like I think of the quote, like T.S. Eliot, I think, um, oh, I forget his name, but, you know, when technology becomes sufficiently advanced, it becomes indistinguishable from magic. I think Bitcoin, in a sense, has become magical. And it's taken on the elements of a religion in the fact that people, rather than understanding the technology, they believe in it, believe in it. It's faith, faith-based. And you see enough people supporting this magic. And, and if you just bear with me here, what I'm getting at is like enough people believe in something and that becomes the fundamental uh, way of determining whether or not that thing is true. Like, it's this whole idea of ash conformity experiment. Like, if enough people say that something is true, it's true. Enough people say the Earth is flat, it's flat. So rather than people actually doing the research and trying to understand this thing, they become, they, 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 they become caught up in this whole magical realm of Bitcoin and say, oh, well, everyone is saying that Bitcoin is this. And you have a look at history and you have a look at how the same things that we're experiencing within the Bitcoin ecosystem have come, have come about within religion as far as the, the denominations of Christianity. Um, I mean, I, I could go. I could take you back into the, the history of Christianity, resembling absolutely nothing um, to what we deem it to be now. And like you would have had this idea, and then it's been obfuscated by the masses. And because the masses don't understand what it is, in fact, I think um, there was a time when only a select few people were able to read the uh, the Bible as such. And then uh, you know, Martin Luther came along. Uh, printing press, all that kind of stuff, and it becomes demystified. But it takes on this magical element, and I, I see how, over time, the majority of people adopt this idea that is no longer in line with the true original idea, which has kind of been um, kept hidden, because <laughs> most people just don't want to open their minds to what's actually going on. And then this, this, other, this other idea becomes the, the main I idea, like the, the Christianity that we know now does not resemble the Christianity of the of the ancient world. And in, in a similar light, just like we forked off and people kind of see BCH um, as being this, this thing which is outside of the actual Bitcoin, not realizing that this is actually close to the vision, this is the same thing that has transpired in history. And it all comes down to education, the fact that people don't want to take it upon themselves to understand what's actually going on. And we're, we're at a time now where, look, the reality is, we have the ability, I mean, someone like yourselves, you, you guys told me that you only got into this stuff over the summer, and you, you guys are uh, amongst the most knowledgeable people that I listen to when it comes to this stuff. And I think of other people, like, there's this uh, this researcher, I think she works in um, med medicine or something along those lines, Marianne, and she's someone that just recently got into Bitcoin, like, this is just 2017. And just over the last few months, she's educated herself, and she's sharing some of the best information on, on Bitcoin, and that's because she's one of the few people that's taken upon herself just through Google to understand how this thing works, to understand the history, the economics, and to, to, like, to make the connections. Most people, on the other hand, and understandably, I don't think they have time for this stuff because this is, this is such a revolutionary area where you're merging economics, which is an entire field of its own. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm new to this stuff. I don't understand a lot of this stuff, you know? And then we have... Uh, uh, we have obviously the the coding side of things. I mean, how many people are going to try to understand the the coding aspect, the the the, the architectural structure of this thing, and then the not not to mention the philosophy. And considering there's so much to understand, 
obviously the normal person isn't going to take it upon themselves to say, I'm going to bother learning it, wh how this thing works. I'm just going to listen to the people that I think know what they're talking about and listen to what the, uh, the majority is saying. And as a result, you get where we're at at the moment. Like, um, I think the Lightning Network is a classic example of that. I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this because I feel, I mean, I myself, I've gone through a lot of stuff. I still couldn't break down how it works specifically. I can talk about the pros and cons of it, but why, what are your thoughts on the Lightning Network? And do you feel as if people understand what that is? Because I feel like if people really understood what it was about, particularly the libertarian side of people, libertarian community, I don't think they would be in line with it. It's, it's kind of like just having another, <laughs> another bank system, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think people really understand Lightning too much. Uh, I think on the BTC core side, they just see it as a solution that we've heard about for a long time now. Um, and it, it's just, that's their solution and it's being worked on and, oh, we're almost there. I think that's what they're they're hearing, but I don't think none of them have really looked into how it works and the channel functionality behind it because it's extremely complicated. And I think it's extremely complicated on purpose. Um, Connor, I see you're smiling over there. <laughs> I, know, I just uh, love would, it, would I be right in saying, Connor, you're the, uh, the Lightning Network ex expert when it comes to understanding this stuff? Uh, I wouldn't call myself a Lightning Network expert because I don't really care enough to become an expert on the Lightning Network? Well, break it down for just the pros and cons. If you had to uh, encapsulate what it's about to a layman like myself, because um, I understand the pros and cons. I mean, I would love to hear it from your own mouth, though, like why you, if, if it may be true, why you would see an issue with a Lightning Network, if there is one. Sure. So where to begin? So I guess the first thing, so all right, so number one, right, today in Bitcoin, uh, if you download a wallet i can send you bitcoin instantaneously uh done i've done that so many times i asked you know i think the worst part is they actually have to ask someone to download an app right and things like cointex have made that easier i i've used cointex a lot i think that people um respond pretty quickly to that as well where i just text them the money um but in bitcoin there's one barrier to entry you download a wallet right and then i can send you bitcoin in the case of lightning you need to enter a channel Right. So, um, so the, obviously we, we understand how Bitcoin works, where everything on chain is occurring block after block after block after block. The idea of lightning network is that I'm going to pay a transaction on chain to open a channel. Let's say I open a channel with you and, uh, that then allows us to transact off chain. And then we can then settle our balances on chain at the very end. So from a very simple perspective of what is that, that's a banking settlement layer, right? Well, that, that's the same thing that happens with, with banking today is, is your actual, uh, you don't actually, let's say, for example, uh, let's say we're, we're really rich, right? And, and we open a channel and then I send you one Bitcoin, you send me half a Bitcoin back, I send you half a Bitcoin back. So uh, in the end, you have one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You don't actually own that Bitcoin until it's it's back on chain. Now, their argument is that, well, you. the reality is what they want to create is just an IOU system. Um, and and there's nothing actually like... So, th so there's two problems with that. Number one, sure, is the IOU system crypto cryptographically secured? Um, yeah. That's fine, right? Uh, you can say, well, it's more secure than the current banking system because it it has to settle on chain and it's still in sure. the blockchain. I, I right? follow you, yeah. Um, but how long is it going to take for you to get it? I mean, could you still see issues if, yeah, exactly. And, and, and the thing that no one talks about is that it, it still requires you to settle back on chain. So it takes a transaction back on chain, which everyone goes, well, that's going to be fine because the blocks will be bigger by then. Says who? Because the thing is, is that, okay, there's a, the perfect quote from Adam Back. Was, it was 2015, I think, where he said, my suggestion is two megabytes now, four megabytes next year, and then like eight megabytes by 2019, right? So they've been lying to you about the increase in the block size for however long anyway. But then also, Luke Dashir, 
wants to decrease the block size. Are we talking so, about Luke, that crazy guy that wants to, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that believes yeah. the tax should be uh, ordained by, as it's ordained by God, and has all these ridiculous <laughs> quotes? Oh, uh, we, we could do a whole podcast about wrong. Luke Jr. Oh, wait, is this Luke Jr.? The same, I, I refer Luke to him as Luke Jr. Jr. That's his name online. Yeah. Yeah, all right, yeah. yeah. Okay, just wanted to be, uh, make, well, make sure I'm on the right page. The, main argument, the problem is that he actually argues that a one megabyte block size is too big. So the, the thing is that you have all these people who come up and they say, well, we're going to increase the box size later. Says who? who? Who says that? Because because the reality is I don't see them ever, ever increasing the block size. And they're going to lose because of that. It, it, they're going to, I don't think about BTC anymore. I, I don't think it is so irrelevant to me. This is such a baloney like financial bubble that's happening right now. I don't care anymore. Like, like Bitcoin to me is at, it's like Bitcoin stopped and then it woke up two years later. It's how it really feels. The price is about what that would mean um, in Bitcoin cash. It, unfortunately, we've just lost time. And, 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 and the reason why the Bitcoin brand is so dear to people is because you have people like Roger Veer who spent his entire 2000, whenever he got in 10 or whatever mm -hmm. to now, promoting Bitcoin. It, so now you want to take all of that away from him just because you want to build this mesh settlement layer that that uh, does nothing. So so sorry to get back to I guess the point. No, I think it's important over. because it kind of uh, it illustrates just the well the the disingenuous arguments that all of the uh, the BTC supporters make in regards to we hate we hate Roger Ver when in well you know historically I mean that only happened, uh, like, uh, like what does he do? Like all the stuff that comes up in regards to like his his past, uh, you know, criminal charges and all that kind of stuff. That was only an issue, obviously, when people didn't like the fact that he was putting his support behind Bitcoin Cash, and it's ridiculous. I mean, we all know at the end of the day that Roger Ver is simply an investor, and he's decided to put his money behind Bitcoin Cash. But of course, people have to find a way of of, of making someone, uh, you know, an evil figure. And you, you get all these character assassinations, which happens not only with Roger, but I guess all the key figures within um, Bitcoin Cash, you know? And it, it's it's become a personality war, and it's yeah. really sad. We did and an episode about that in general. It is, because just... the thing is, it's so important. Most people don't think in terms of logic and reason. They're more moved by emotion. And uh, like one of, the, one of the biggest arguments, and I'm going to be completely honest about this, for BTC, um, at least from my perspective, is that... Uh, people don't necessarily care about technology, what's going to be better. They care more about personalities. They care more about consensus. And you can have not, al not always the best technology, the best idea is something that uh, perpetuates historically. I mean, socialism is the classic example of that. <laughs> and we, we have plenty of, plenty, of, um, plenty of technologies that have not... That, have not necessarily been the best at what they do, but they've had the right kind of marketing. And the fact that, and I, I listened to a awesome interview. This was this was with Craig Wright, and uh, I forget the guy. This is actually the best interview Craig Wright's ever done. This is where he he actually spoke about what he was going to be doing at the CoinGeek conference, which I want to get into in a, in a bit. But the the guy that was arguing for BTC, he made the argument that um, he cares about the people that are associated with. Bitcoin Cash, and that's one of the reasons why he wouldn't want to support it. Now, granted, what Craig Wright is is saying, and he was saying that you know Bitcoin Cash is going to blow BTC out of the out of the water, you know, because it's coming up with all of these amazing technologies, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to do everything better. But at the end of the day, the fact that Bitcoin Cash, in the eyes of the many people, still has this reputation of being associated with big guys, big cash, and centralization, and uh, and people that are uh, are greedy and all this kind of stuff. Just the, the the key figures that are around this, people, and the majority of people, and I would say like ninety five percent of people that don't really care in regards to the the history, the economics, the the technology, are going to side with whatever they think is popular and the the figures that they like, like Richard Hart, people like uh, I I don't know, like all the uh, Sa Sam Mao. Even though I can't see anyone that has any semblance of. Eh ethics wanting to support that guy with some of the comments that he's tweeted but do you understand what i'm saying like i think it's a huge popularity war and when, during that whole conversation that we had back with bin armani there was this guy that made an argument i was completely like i was getting annoyed at this guy because he was kind of just a character assassinating people i'm not a big fan of that um but he took a go i took a shot at craig wright because 
he doesn't like the way that Craig Wright has been presenting himself as a figure and was making the argument that in order to, and this guy is Bitcoin Cash Maximalist, right? But he's making the argument that in order to, uh, to, to paint the right image of, of Bitcoin Cash in the public, we need to, uh, to fix up uh, the, the profile of certain individuals like Craig Wright, etc. When personally, I think he's freaking awesome. I think the fact that he doesn't want to uh, be a puppet and say all the, the, the nice stuff that everyone else is saying, it says it as it is, is what makes it appealing. But I don't know if the majority actually want to hear that. So it's just an interesting argument I find. I, I actually hear that a lot. I hear that a ton of, from people that, like, I mean, people I know in person that I, I talk to them about Bitcoin Cash. They go mm -hmm. do research and they're like, I just oh, don't get why cool. Roger and Craig have to be such dicks. Yeah. I mean, it's just like. You realize I, kind of, so protocol has nothing you're, to you're, do with these figures, but still, right? But you're still. spot on, and that's what people care about, which is just kind of unfortunate. Right. Um, Absolutely. I think. Kind of to elaborate too on the BTC core side, you know, they talk about how they're all for decentralization, but their thoughts and their knowledge is actually all completely centralized. And I think that's another problem that we kind of have is that people are hype about decentralization and they also need to look at themselves and decentralize the way that they think. As that's well. actually a very like a meta way of looking at that, man, like centralization of thoughts. I think that's what's happening in the BTC community. I like that, man. And it is. I mean, I'm very much against that whole idea of things. I mean, I, of course, I believe in research, but um, I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but I'll, I'll often just do exactly the opposite of what the majority are doing. Not necessarily because it's a good thing, but because I don't want to be caught up with what the, the hive mind is doing. You know, like I feel like that's just this, this drum of let me just do what everyone else is doing without actually taking some ownership and believing something you believe because of your own convictions. I, I much more admire people that are willing to stand out and do something that maybe can be completely insane, you know, but stick to it because it's in line with who they are. That's one of the things I admire about Roger Ver, and I know he gets so much crap, but, and I, I'm not, I don't necessarily think that the way that he's handled things is, actually, yeah, I do. I do like the, I, I actually like the fact that he's been in your face about it and been very confrontational, adversarial. I find that very entertaining, at least, whereas you compare someone like Andreas Antonopoulos, who's the first guy that I became like a, a mad supporter of well, this is when I was first learning about Bitcoin. He is now granted he you know says it as, as it is, but he's far more diplomatic, far more pleasing, far more political. If you have a look at how he addressed um, I think it was the the Canadian Senate or like he had these hearings discussing Bitcoin, and he does this in a much more diplomatic way and kind of speaks to people in these in in the way that politicians do. Like he's very. He's very careful about what he says, but Roger Ver, on the other hand, is kind of like, well, I don't see a problem with insider trading. Why is insider trading bad? Um, uh, you know, I, yeah. he's, he says all of these things that the majority are going to hate, but he's just being honest to him about what he believes. And uh, right. well, and I think, I, well, I think too, if you, so okay, yeah, they're bombastic, or whoever you're talking about, whether it's Roger, or Craig, whoever, yeah, they might be bombastic, and and you might disagree with them, but. If you are diplomatic in this space, you lose. That's how – look at um, – this is a perfect example. Gavin Andreessen, he yeah. has essentially been bullied out of the community. Um, Colin uh, – Colin, I don't know if he wants – Colin Enstead, he's on Twitter. He did that Bitcoin Cash uh, barber commercial. He was kind of behind that thing. Oh, I saw that. I'm not sure if I've seen cool. that, but, but go on. Um, but he reached out to Gavin – asking if he would do kind of like a, a bit for they're making a documentary on the scaling debate right sure and gavin said i'm sorry i don't do interviews anymore which yeah. I, I totally 100 percent respect his like right to i respect privacy. that but yeah. yeah fair enough but but why doesn't he do interviews anymore it's it's because it, i mean you know there's a whole other want to deal with the backlash. he's got a family it, it takes a, a, a lot of character to be able to deal with that stuff like most people could not be a roger ver most people cannot be your great Craig Wright. And I'm not talking about technical ability or, or any of that stuff. I'm talking about character, like being able to deal with that kind of bullshit. Um, it's, it's, yeah. it's the one thing that I find um, is the testing point of every virtue, you know, courage, like ability to actually stand in the face of, of opposition like that. And Roger Ver, I, if you have a look at any Twitter post, I love going there because of all the horrible and sometimes funny. I love that kind of stuff. But he seems to deal with it pretty well. And people say that he's got psych, psych, psychiatric problems and nonsense like that, but he's never, I've only seen him once ever lose his cool. And that was with this um, interview he did where the, the classic uh, image of him sticking his middle finger, but he's generally pretty diplomatic. And granted, he's very, 
not diplomatic. Should be more careful with my words, but um, cool. The guy Collected. deserved the middle finger. There Sorry? Too, so. The guy deserved the middle finger there. Absolutely. Too, so. But sorry to interject there. I forgot where you were going with your point. I think we I lost you there. Uh, well, I think I just like, I mean, I think the problem is being diplomatic in this space yes. because of the use of, and look, when Roger got mad about that, he was mad because the guy accused him of using sock puppet accounts. Exactly. I would be mad too because the only people using sock puppet accounts are the people responding to Roger Veer's Twitter, right? So, so... I, I don't actually like being diplomatic in this space would I, I think there are benefits to being nice. I think obviously people might be more yeah. uh, willing to listen to you, but um, there's absolutely no reason to be diplomatic or nice in, in this space because you're not going to get treated that way by the other side, unfortunately. Yeah, and, well, and it's so, a compromise, you know, you, you, you're compromising the truth. And I mean, I like Peter uh jordan peterson's approach to this like he's got this whole attitude about speaking the truth because regardless of um whether you do you're damned if you don't and you're damned if you do i mean people are going to hate you for speaking the truth and p and when you don't speak the truth sometimes i mean yeah it it it, um, it has implications you know that are um are, are negative as well and it, it's at the end of the day you're damned either way so you might as well just stand for what you believe is true because look, whereas you could say that um, it's good to it's it's a bad idea being diplomatic. I would actually make the argument that, particularly with the state of things, I mean, just moving a little away from Bitcoin right now, like, um, particularly in 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 relation to like, uh, you know, whether it's social justice or whether it's um, like identity politics, simply saying things that are not popular are likely to get you ducks, likely to get you punched on the street. I mean, with the whole situation in in the states with Trump. Uh, uh, I mean, people get into trouble for wearing the uh, Make America Great, Great, Great Again hat. And I'm like, I, I've seen people just actually get arrested for, 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 for silly comments, you know, like calling someone um, a mum, you know, saying they look like a mum. This is, yeah, man. This is, so it makes sense that people are worried about being um, offended. In fact, there was a classic uh, debate that took place, uh, I think, just last weekend in regards to political correctness um, with dealing with, I think it was by the, uh, I, I forget, but the point is this whole idea of diplomacy, political correctness. Um, the reason people do this stuff is because they don't want to get destroyed by the uh, the uh, the Segwa justice warriors, as I like to say. Yeah. But uh, one of the things I really want to get into, because one of the things that we've seen in the Coin Geek Conference, which has come about, uh, other than the whole discussion on governance, is Craig Wright's announcement of atomic swats and swaps in oblivious transfers uh, about a month ago on this um this interview which um the name of the interview eludes me he made he, he made the point that at his next conference at the coin conference he's going to be making a presentation that would blow everyone out of the water that would make all of these other altcoins side chains and it got me very very interested and i finally just listened to the uh, the presentation on youtube and yeah it absolutely blew me out of the water i think it uh, from what I understand, and I, maybe you, maybe you guys, are, I don't you guys are clued up on everything when it comes to the world of Bitcoin Cash. So um, you guys can take the lead with this one. But apparently, uh, we now have the technology to allow for a, for for transfers. So if someone wants to transfer Ethereum to Dash or make any change to a different cryptocurrency, it can be done on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain without any cost, which essentially makes exchanges obsolete. In addition to that, we got oblivious transfers now, which I don't understand too much, but apparently we can have um, uh, like passwords linked to your private key. It's gonna, it's gonna allow for a great deal more privacy when it comes to your information. Perhaps you guys can deal, you guys can go into that a bit more, because I'm curious with um with these technologies and how they're gonna, I guess, affect the uh, the crypto world over the next few months. I think uh, yeah. people are kind of underestimating. Or people are kind of underestimating. I think this a lot. They don't really realize the implications of what this actually happens. Um, I think we're starting to look at more of a world where everything's going to be tokenized, and everything's going to happen through the blockchain, and that includes maybe T-shirts. You know, T-shirts can be tokenized. Um, pretty much any uh, cups can be. Uh, Tokenize as well. What do you mean by know. that? I'm not sure if I fully understand. So when you say tokenizing cups and shirts, and what what does that mean? What what are we doing when we tokenize these things? One thing with me, I kind of thought about it this weekend. I was shopping, and it kind of hit me. Um, I was shopping, and 
someone was returning a shirt and I was just thinking of the return process, you know, they kind of, they return that shirt back to the store and the store kind of assumes that the shirt was bought there with that receipt. Yeah. Um, what if there was a way to t- kind of tokenize that shirt? That way, you know, that the ownership has gone from the t-shirt company to the customer, then back over to the t-shirt company when they return it. Um, and obviously it would have to be at the whim of the company as well, you know, to make okay. sure that it hasn't been worn or anything like that. So you can track everything but essentially. You can track every item. And- exactly. And you can kind of track the ownership of the shirt too. Like if someone brought it back and then <sighs> someone bought it again or returned it back, you can kind of see that, you know, oh, this shirt has been returned several times already. Why is that? Or yeah. should maybe be a discounted uh that's and huge. Th- this is kind of just a day-to-day example of what I kind of thought of like a tokenized world that we'll live sure. in. Um, and I mean, there, it goes on and on and on. But I think uh, that's kind of the world that we're starting to look at. The implications of that, world. though, are huge. I mean, is is there a limit to, I mean, do people want to have that out in the open? I mean, the, the whole privacy argument, like perhaps I don't want everyone to know what I own. Actually, I, I can't right. see that. Really, as I said that, I can't really see that. But yeah. I can imagine some kind of privacy arguments. I mean, obviously, you can track a lot more than ownership with t- when you tokenize something. And if everything now is being stored on the blockchain, I mean, granted, it is essentially unhackable. I mean, I, I'm just curious in regards to the implication when it comes to privacy, if you're tokenizing everything, if everything now is recorded. Uh, I, I really haven't thought too much in regards to the ramifications of this, but... Well, it's an interesting concept. We're moving into a new world at the moment, right? Right. And I don't think we necessarily know what it's going to look like. Um, But I think in like the privacy terms, I think privacy is almost going to turn more into a cost, a little bit of a cost. Um, Like we may have to pay for that extra privacy um, or anonymous uh, transactions or something like that. Um, so, I'm not well, really sure. Uh, that's just my guess. <laughs> I think it's twofold. I think number one, I think I've, I've wrestled myself with that thought that, you know, if everything is tokenized and on chain, I think we are going to have to start. If we want this to work out, you're going to have to become comfortable with the idea that, um, you know, if, if you buy a good, there's some kind of, there's a hash associated with that that good and, and if you do something with that good someone will know you know um sure on the it's already hand, happening the, right the now idea. on on the internet i mean i'll be, I'll be often using youtube you know then i'll go into facebook and i'll find out that i'm getting an advertisement for something that i've just a, a video that i've just watched and it creeps into all these different aspects of all the social media you use how'd you know that about me how'd you know i was just watching a, a video on that oh damn you guys know everything and of course don't even get me started on the iphone man and I mean, you hear yeah. McAfee going about this kind of stuff, and you have to realize that any time that you put anything out, on particularly on your iPhone, man, the the world knows it, where you are, everything. So it's kind of it's just the the nature of technology, unfortunately. You know, too much. No, is there anything? Is too much knowledge a thing? Is that something uh, well, we should be worried about? Way too, right? I mean, so well, so number one, right? So the idea of oblivious transfers is the idea that we can have true fungibility in Bitcoin Cash. So um, it would be done with some kind of computational uh, smart contract or whatever you, whatever it is. It, it would take some kind of computation on chain, which would then cost. I don't know if you saw. I saw the video. I would, I would recommend Clemens Lay's presentation that he gave at Satoshi's Vision about how Bitcoin is turned complete, which obviously is something Craig said years ago and, and was laughed at, essentially. Um, but he, you know, Clemens kind of walks through that and shows that so with ethereum if you want to make a computation there's there's a, something called gas in ethereum and it mm-hmm. it's really a centrally planned uh fee system to to prevent you from running large computations and, and and letting that just run wild on the ethereum virtual machine in bitcoin the, the nice thing is that bitcoin is already turned complete and your computations are linked to the number of transactions you make there's already a built-in economic factor as to okay well i want to do this computation therefore requires this many transactions for example therefore i'm going to pay this much in transaction fees right um so so fungibility according to you know dr wright's presentation which he you know there's a patent out there for this so if someone who is technically minded might be able to start uh discerning exactly how that's going to work um 
but uh, so so I guess the privacy aspect is possible according according to to Craig who gave this kind of presentation. But I will also say about your iPhone. I think this is kind of interesting too. Sure. Uh, it, you know, yes. So obviously Google and, and Facebook, whoever else, they track data with you. But um, something I find kind of interesting is that if you can tokenize every transistor on a laptop, which, you know, if we can tokenize the universe squared, which is what Craig said at the end of his presentation. Yeah, I you can that. that's pretty dope. tokenize every single transistor on your laptop. You can ensure from manufacturing to to shipping to you that that laptop had never been tampered with, which is the biggest concern with respect to privacy of, of from surveillance of, of governments. And, and the supply chains have been uh, interrupted in, in so many cases of, you know, Intel CPUs, things like that. Um, so if you can start tokenizing these things, and, and uh, that to me is one of the most interesting things that might come out of this, where it you is. as the buyer... Can, can be ensured that nothing interrupted the supply chain from manufacturing to you. Um, you know, it's funny actually hearing, like, as I'm listening to you talk about this, and it's slowly dawning on me just the, the huge implication of this, uh, the whole tokenizing everything is a huge deal. It is it is almost like a, another area of Bitcoin that has exploded. I mean, we have the internet, we have Bitcoin, and then we have a top, you, this whole world of a uh, tokenization it's almost as big a thing as the the preceding the, the the previous two things i mentioned there i mean the the concept of tokenizing everything now like the idea of being able to track everything like that on the blockchain that's um i think it's something that's going to start being talked about a lot i think the, the presentation was just it was just shared just a few hours ago and uh, i'm going to put the links down there but i'm curious i mean one one of the things that we we just touched on was obviously we got Enchain. We have Enchain through Craig Wright releasing all of these amazing patents on the Bitcoin Cash uh, cryptocurrency blockchain. And uh, I, I know a lot of people within the, the, the libertarian um, world are, are, are kind of mixed about that. Obviously, from a, a team kind of mindset, I'm like, yeah, man, fuck everyone else. Bitcoin Cash maximization, you know, I, I love the fact that we're, I mean, it's, it's crazy to me because we have this thing, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, that has hundreds of hundreds of patents waiting to be applied on it is technologically more advanced than everything else is from a purely technical standpoint is actually blowing everything out of the water the fact that we have atomic swaps now that are the technology is there this stuff is hypothetical i feel like a lot of people were thinking uh craig rides a fraud he's saying he's gonna be able to do all this kind of stuff but he's not gonna be able to do it. it's bullshit so they, they never bought into it but we now have seen over the last few months Everything that N. Shane Craig Wright has been saying they would do that this year would uh, would, uh, uh, would would uh, yeah would ensure is now happening. And to me, it's 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 incredible. However, the whole idea of um, of Bitcoin Cash taking on this kind of like uh, I, I guess a lot of people within the libertarian community hate the idea of patents. And um, I guess I'm curious to to hear what what your thoughts are on this um, on on Bitcoin Cash taking dominance um, and having these technologies exclusively limited to the Bitcoin Cash block blockchain? My view on the patents is it's kind of more of a security right now mm -hmm. um, in terms of like if Enchain doesn't do it, um, someone else might go and do it and what kind of troubles that could cause. Um, I, I don't really like getting too much into the patent debate too much because I, I kind of see both sides of it yeah. for sure. Um, but I, I've kind of come to the conclusion a little bit that the patents are seen as more of a security thing for Bitcoin Cash to succeed because we've seen it over and over again that you know with with Bitcoin Core, you've had kind of things that have attacked it, um, other systems that have attacked it. Um, not necessarily people don't want to lose control of their money system, you know, I'm not, I, I won't go down the conspiracy route on it. Yeah, but, sure. Um, well, sure. That's a, that's a valid point. I, I guess to me, the, the philosophical argument is that, wait a sec, you don't, you can't own certain ideas, you know, and, um, from a libertarian mindset, the way that I look at it is, look, if I come up with an idea and, uh, I, I, I want to put that out into the into the world, and I want to say that look, if you use this, you have to to give me a certain amount. I provided it's voluntary. I get to choose what I want to do with it. If I create a song, it's mine, and I say, look, I'm going to sell you this song, but you can only sell it to other people if uh, if 
based off of these reasons or X and Y, or I don't want you selling my song to anyone else. That's a consensual agreement. It just becomes really, really difficult because when it comes to intellectual property, um, it's something that you can't control. If you create something and someone, a third party, um, gains access to that, like you've sold it to someone, and then a third party somehow gains access to that information, you can't somehow prevent that third party from now having access to that information and say that they don't have the ability to, to let's say, sing a song that you wrote because you've heard that song. It's a little complicated, but to me, when it comes down to it, it comes down to a voluntary agreement. If I created a, an agreement with someone that they're not able to use this technology that I created um, outside of, well, outside of this, um, of, well, outside of these terms, that's that's fine, provided they agree to it. You know what I mean? I'll, um, I'll say two things because I sure. think I think it. I, I I definitely sympathize with both sides of the argument. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, college me would have been, yeah, information is free and I have the right to pirate everything and, and whatever else. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, I think the biggest example is like, okay, if you are an artist, I don't understand the argument you could possibly make to say the artist doesn't own their song. That to me seems it, that argument ha I think breaks down very quickly. If you really think that me, let's say I'm a musician and I create a new song that that automatically no longer belongs to me. That to me is a very socialist idea, a very collectivist idea. Right. I agree. So I and, think from a, yeah, from an logical stance, I, I think I am aligned with the intellectual property side of things. I think obviously there are patent trolls that, that, that is, a, but that's the other thing this space patents in this space aren't going to go away. It, Bank of America governments, they're all trying to do it. So if the argument is that no one should do it, then we're just going to get blindsided by people much more powerful than us, than, than, uh, you know, I'm talking banks, governments. So sure. I, I, it's not like That's all because process too. yeah, if we all go, Oh, patents are bad. We're not going to use patents on Bitcoin. We can say that all we want. But mm -hmm. someone else is going to come in and do it, and they're going to probably cause a lot more havoc if they try to do it that way. Yeah, look, I'm I'm with you. It is a complicated one. Um, I'm, as a musician myself, I feel the same way. If I create a song, um, obviously it's it's my song. But, um, being more practical and, and just as honest as I can be about it, um, it it's very difficult to implement because it's one thing if someone steal, breaks into my house and steals my song. Granted, you're you're the one that's initiated violence. You've actually taken something that was not yours, and you've you've, you've broken into you violated me in order to get that. So obviously, I have a right to prevent you from using that song. But the the tricky thing is, particularly the way the internet works, the world works. If someone just happens to hear your song, or or some someone happens to uh to without violating you gain access to a piece of information that you've written and now you're telling them that they're not able to actually uh, reproduce that even though it's in their head the idea of owning something that is as intangible as information like the idea that you can somehow restrict someone's ability to have access to something that they have gained without violating anyone that's the issue so it always comes down to the implementation of it provided you are are, are not violating someone in order to get that information. I mean, if I create something that's mine and I create a technology that prevents people from accessing it, of course I have a right to do that. It's mine and I can create a technology that you don't have the right to access. You can't access. However, if I create something and through no fault of your own, you've just found out about that, you've heard a song from me, the idea of me saying you can't sing that song now, the idea of me saying that you, you have this information in your head now and you're not able to reproduce this, that is what I think a lot of the... Um, um, people that are anti-intellectual property, they take issue with because the idea of trying to apply that in the real world is just not, it's just not feasible. So um, I think, uh, it requires the intervention of, of the state. Yes. And, and so I sympathize with that too. And, and But I do think we might enter in a world where maybe I, I could envision a world where patents are, are done privately and, and are enforced in a private manner as well. So, oh, bro. You gotta watch one of the best TV shows that I've seen. I think it's called Incorporated. You gotta check this out because it actually deals with this whole issue. And I gotta be honest, man. Like it actually, I think it was made by socialists. But here's the thing: it was really honest because it shows just the some of the crazy pitfalls of when you have an incredibly um, corporate system. Where I mean, I mean, I remember hearing about. Sorry, there there, there were 
aspects of the movie that spoke about, let's say you voluntarily agree to a contract where uh, um, the, the, the corporation owns you. Oh, no, no, better idea, better idea. So intellectual property, right? Now, let's say you've learned something and you've, um, you, you've learned something that you've stolen a piece of information, all right? Now there's a piece of t technology that can actually extract that information from your mind. So now we can actually go into your mind and extract that. I'm like, whoa, man, that's I didn't know about that. So now people have are now able to take away things from your mind because you violated their intellectual property. I mean, these this is these are some of the concepts that you start to think about when you were um, looking at things within the realm of like a. Uh, a, a capitalist system, and I think this is the issue that a lot of socialists uh, have problems with. You know, the the fact that it does seem like it makes you, oh fuck! Particularly when you add technology into it. I mean, at what point? I mean, the tokenization is the classic example. The fact that we can now tokenize everything um, voluntarily, of course, but still, like living in a world where people have access. To, I mean, even the idea of people knowing everything about me right now on the internet. I mean, if you use YouTube. People can dox you. It's it's something that is very unsettling to a lot of people, um, but it's the world that we're moving into, particularly with Bitcoin. The fact that now the and this is what scares the governments. The fact that people can transact now, um, they can send and they can launder money. Any I just brought up Bitcoin on a date last night, right? And she's like, this girl was saying, yeah, but what what about all the people that are going to launder money with it? That's horrible. I mean, do you want people to be um, selling drugs and all like? Well, uh, I I actually don't have a problem. <laughs> You know, but <laughs> it does it does actually bring into question um, just the the implications of a lot of these technologies, and it unsettles a lot of people. And I think that's the the problem that we're we're definitely having to address. I mean, this is such a new technology, Bitcoin, um, atomic swaps, and we're having to address this in real time. And it's evolving so fast that the governments are are struggling to keep up with it. I see. I'm constantly um tuned into the Bitcoin.com website, and I'm getting updates even is even as I'm talking to you and I'm reading them I'm like whoa they just done that oh they just done that they put that regulation and it's like we're seeing this exponential growth of technology now and in a few years time we're going to see the bitcoin cash revolution the technological revolution at this height and we we I've I've heard Craig Wright speaking about implementing um you know bitcoin cash you know uh, using artificial like just applying this stuff um with uh with with self driverless with driverless cars with uh I mean, there's so many different applications for Bitcoin in in the world of technology, and I think we're we're definitely at, in fascinating times. I think talking about intellectual property and you know tokenization and everything, mm -hmm. I you kind of um, made me think about this too, and I've heard it um, from several people before. Is the tokenization of like maybe putting tokenization on the songs that you write, so that when it's played somewhere, you as the songwriter have access and it costs money for that person to access your song. Yeah, um, well, that's cool. And I think every, yeah. I think this whole system is going to kind of transfer over to a system where nothing is free anymore, but everything is substantially cheaper for for everyone. Um, so just like songs, um, like we pay a subscription fee right now for, for Spotify. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that'll transfer over to pay each song as you listen to it uh, for the time amount that you listen to it. Um, you can start paying for things as you use them instead of this this flat fee. Um, and I think that kind of system is kind of cool for a song artist, you know, to have rights to how many how many times they get their song listened to. Um, obviously, that encourages you to produce good songs that Absolutely. people listen. Um, so it, I don't know. It kind of goes back to a competitive system and everything. You know, you put a cost on it, you compete. Um, and I think that's kind of the world that we're kind of going over to. But I think we do have some pr problems with that too, yeah. privacy issues. And um, but I think it is kind of interesting because that just kind of hit me—the intellectual property. That maybe if I post an article every time that someone accesses it through the blockchain, you know, I get paid for it. Uh, I get paid for how long they're they're reading it for, or something like that. Um, it's pretty cool. Pretty it cool. Is. To see and I where love we're this going. because these are the conversations that we should be having more of. And I think by doing well, your podcast, I I love the fact that it's a uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it's getting that conversation started. And it is actually shaping the uh, the landscape of the world of crypto. I mean, Vin Armani just mentioned recently that he granted um a lot a lot of people took issue with the the simple tweet he shared about 
um, why he should stick to using Cointex on Bitcoin Cash. But that led to a lot of bunch of other conversations, you know. And look, quite possibly, that may have led to Jihan Wu probably thinking about this same thing in regards to governance model at the same time. And now it's led to uh, an evolution in uh, the way ways in which we can fund Bitcoin. And I, it's, it's created this whole chain of events. And I think by having these com conversations, it's what creates change. That's why one of the reasons I love listening to your podcast. I love, um, you know, just keep trying to stay t tuned with what's going on here because I truly believe, I mean, granted, I'm, I'm not like a huge nerd. I mean, I'm first and foremost, I'm a performer. I, I love singing and dancing, but I, fi I find what is going on here right now in regards to Bitcoin Cash, it's touching on so many important aspects of technology that it's one of the most, it is the most revolutionary thing that's happening right now. Well, where is there a lot of activists out there that are trying to change the world? When you realize just how core money is in changing things and how by by actually putting money into the hands of power, like by actually forming this uh, this uh, system of Bitcoin, you know, like a cryptocurrency by the people, it's the, the most powerful way in making change in the world. And for someone like me, I mean, granted, um, I, I have many passions, but I've always found that uh, changing, you know, the, the landscape is is one of the most powerful things you can do when it comes to um, perpetuating the whole idea of, of freedom, which is what I'm all about, if you want to call that capitalism, voluntarism. But I think this is what is happening in the, the, the space right now, and it's it's making it the most fascinating thing that's going on in regards to technology, economics, and the next few years are going to be revolutionary. So um, for, I, I, want, I just want to commend what you guys are doing. I think it's awesome. I love the fact that you guys are really, I, as I keep saying, you talk about the philosophical side of things. You're, you spend a lot of time research. It's amazing that just over the last, I don't know, it's probably only been just a year or two, and you guys seem to have like a full grasp on all these different aspects of, of Bitcoin. And it just shows that if people are, I mean, granted, I can't say, I can't expect everyone to spend the amount of time that you guys have. I mean, you guys are going through the Satoshi uh, files. That's another thing. I mean, I, it, it just dawned on me that many people, I mean, I consider myself to be obsessed with learning about Satoshi and Craig Wright and all that kind of stuff. But there is a lot of information that people haven't um, taken upon themselves to, to learn. And you guys are the first people that, it will, that I've come across that have been advocating for people learning about the Satoshi emails. It seems to be somewhat esoteric. But there's all this other literature out there. I mean, granted, there are people that are really, really involved in this thing they're aware of them but i think people that really want to understand oh, this whole bitcoin thing what it's about need to start going through the uh satoshi emails like can you can you guys go into have you guys spent much time going into the emails because i noticed that you shared that on your on your twitter just recently recommending uh, yeah yeah checking that stuff out uh yeah yeah it's uh well i think to get kind of back to what you're saying it i, I think what kind of hit me the most mm -hmm. was like understanding that no one understands the system um when you kind of realize that and then it, it kind of hit you i mean I, I i know i keep bringing it up but the fact that no one understood the topology of the network the first person to i'm telling i think the biggest moment in bitcoin's history was the future of Bitcoin conference where Craig Wright gave his, where John Matonis gave his speaking time over to Craig Wright. Sure. And I saw that one. That was a, that was my um, uh, epiphany, epiphany moment as well. You know, there, there's so much to learn from that one present. I've gone back and rewatched it multiple times because it, it, you learn more as you keep going back because he really came on the scene and said, you have it all wrong. Stop and think. And then he walked through a lot of the core concepts, but, to me, the, the most amazing thing is that no one even understood that this is a separate to network topology and, and, and um, what that unlocks, what that what that means for. So so if you if you want to take Satoshi's word for the zero confirmation problem where, you know, the, the most Craig sounding thing you could think of is if you don't get it, I don't have the time to explain it to you or whatever. Um, it, if, if you go back and look at that, all he was saying was because you have to understand the topology of the network to understand why zero confirmation works. And, and so now you have everyone on the BTC side of things, and even Samson in his uh, debate with Roger was just like, well, you need three confirmations and the magical crypto 
kitties, they talk about this all the time. They make fun of the idea of zero confirmation, whatever else. And, and it's like, no one is stopping to think about, about what the network is. No one is stopping to think maybe Satoshi did have a lot of this figured out. Maybe he did create something. Maybe they were a very, very, very intelligent academic that had invented something completely brand new that no one has thought about. And, and that is absolutely what it was. So yeah, yeah, I, I would say go back to the emails, go back to the big ones I talked about are the ones, the emails with Mike Hearn, which mm -hmm. he just shared last August. So no one had seen these emails until last August. And Mike asked some very, very basic questions um, to Satoshi. And Satoshi took uh, quite a bit of time to spell it out for him. And thank God Satoshi did, because these are questions that people are still wrestling with today. And they, they haven't gone back just to look and, and be like, oh, wait, this was figured out a very, very long time ago. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend reading the emails. I'm really appreciative of uh, Derek McGill. He definitely deserves a shout out because he just, I think, took it upon himself Mm -hmm. Very recently, the Satoshi yeah. Nakamoto Institute people um, didn't invite Daniel uh, Krawis, I think is his name, to this event they're putting on about the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, which he founded. Um, so talk about, you know, classic like BTC core stuff. But Absolutely. Uh, I, I often, I, I think I've read every article on Derek McGill's side. He's another guy that's doing amazing stuff, um, really gets the philosophy behind this, the economics and uh, kudos to him. I want to give a shout out to him. Shout out to you guys, obviously, for what you're doing. Uh, I think it's so important to uh, to have these conversations. I think they're more important than um, people actually realize. You often don't realize people that may not necessarily agree with you. Like you're you're planting seeds, you know, when you you launch these ideas, and uh, it will maybe not on a direct level, but it can influence the the whole topography of of Bitcoin, you know, in 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 a positive way. So. I think um, I think these are definitely playing a role. If you're a Bitcoin maximalist, if you are um, really invested in having this thing become the king, um, then you should be not only you know telling people to accept Bitcoin Cash, but you should be having these conversations with as many people that are open to them as possible and talking about even the unpleasant things. You know, like I know a lot of people say you know like the Bitcoin Cash maximalists tell you that they don't want to use. They don't. They should, anyone should. Anyone that supports Bitcoin Cash should not be using any other cryptocurrencies like uh, Ethereum and Dash. And I know Vin gets a lot of flack for this, but um, you know, the, but even presenting the argument like why, why not, and trying to challenge some of the ideas, I think is important because as as is shown with the whole situation with Vin Armani, that led to a, a conversation I think was necessary to be had in regards to the governance model, in regards to why it's not a good idea, and uh, it's definitely. Um, it's been it's been a positive thing. So, um, guys, um, I want I want to wind it out around here. Was there anything that you guys wanted to talk about that we haven't covered? We've almost done a, a couple of hours here, and it, we covered a lot of cool stuff. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about? What perhaps what are things people can do to promote Bitcoin Cash? In your opinion, the best things that you can do. I think just discussion too. Just open up the discussion. I think uh, discussion is the best way to learn. I, I maybe yeah, can maybe speak for Connor too. But I mean, I've learned more from just talking about this with Connor than than a lot of the research that I've done on my own. Because until you actually apply knowledge um, and you start using it, mm -hmm. uh, that's when you learn the most. I think application is the best way to learn. And I think, you know, for more and more people to learn about it, I think, you know, you just got to keep having discussions and over and over and over. And that's why I'm involved in a meetup right now in New York. It's just about and, to mention, uh, yeah. Just, just to bring people together and start talking about it. Um, and just another thing that I just want to emphasize too is no one should look at names or personalities. You know, they should look at the facts and data that, Backs, um, backs up those, those hard, solid facts. Um, Cause another issue I just ha have with the community right now is the tribalism and everyone's following different people and we're not all alike. This is all about being an individual and being an individual means that you're different from everyone else and everyone should have pride in that and everyone should respect that as well. Um, the fact that people are different, you know, we need to start respecting that a little bit more instead of personally attacking other people you yeah. know for what they believe not everyone's yeah, chastising people for conforming to not conforming to group consensus you know 
Um, but that's one of the things that I, I like about the message that you and and, De- and uh, Derek are, are putting out there, you know, like to think for yourselves, do the research, um, realize that not everything is right because everyone else is saying it. And uh, I think that's that's the attitude that is about enlightenment, you know. I mean, this thing to me is more than just technology. It's more than just uh, economics. It's a whole philosophical idea. And uh, the more that I, I learn about uh uh, about Bitcoin, you know, and understand the the whole principles behind it. Uh, I I tend to, yeah, I tend to be in favor of it along the lines of you know free interaction. Like there is a philosophy behind this, and the fact that the Bitcoin Cash community I find is the only community right now that is even coming close to well to this whole idea compared to everyone else is why um, fundamentally I'm very much in favor of this. If this thing was purely just about making money getting limousines i wouldn't have the passion i like the fact that i can i can transact i can i can donate to eat bch and like know that w- without even with, with, with that with just a you know with just a few clicks of a button i can significantly have an impact on other people's lives like that and uh this whole thing this whole thing is having a beneficial effect on the world as opposed to just trying to to huddle and <laughs> go to the moon you know that this idea that's perpetuated by a lot of the the BTC hodlers. So uh, I know that's just me ranting, but yeah. I once well, again, I, I really sal- sorry, sorry, Corey. No, no, I'm I, I, I just going to jump in and, and just say that I think kind of even I guess piggybacking what Corey said and what you're saying here is that uh, people like people talking about this stuff is obviously important, and, and mm-hmm. like I'll say for us too, like. We didn't think anyone was gonna like listen. Then necessarily like like I don't we're not like I it was Ryan Charles recently he said you know we need more people talking about this stuff out there talking and, and and saying because I think a lot of people on the Bitcoin Cash side of things it, it is a silent majority in some ways obviously not the majority necessarily in the market but um, the majority in terms of coherent argument in in terms of coherent. Uh, uh, opinions and 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 so, I, I it's not like I, I don't know. I I will speak probably for both of us. It's not like we necessarily want to, like, become personalities or anything like. It's just I we, no one is talking about this stuff. You you know, again I applaud you. I've listened to quite a few of your interviews. It, it, it we need to just start having this conversation because the problem is is that they have the BTC side of things does have this social farm whether it's organic or not of of spreading information out and and uh we need to do our part i think to to affect the the collective consciousness that that exists on twitter and and wherever else and and you need to start getting people to start questioning their own opinions and and, you know you mentioned jordan peterson earlier and this is something i saw joseph von perling said very eloquently too like we need to start asking like what can we learn from people um Absolutely. If someone's talking Salient to you, you need to ask, "What can you learn from that person?" and and, and stop. Uh, that that is completely gone from quite a bit of the crypto community. So powerful. Well, guys, I really enjoyed talking to you guys. Um, I I salute what you're doing. You guys are scholars, you're gentlemen. I really appreciate what you're sharing on the Beach Boys podcast. I highly recommend everyone checking you guys out. You guys have become the the staple for uh, disseminating information in the uh, in the uh, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, eco space so um i i got your details up on my podcast here the beach boy at the beach boys and i'll be sure to put down the links to uh, all your other stuff uh yeah ladies and gentlemen um there you have it i'm gonna i'm gonna wind this thing down once again i really appreciate you guys giving up your time right now and uh, i'll be sure thank to stay much. tuned yeah. keep us posted thank keep you. sharing your your information brothers thank, thank you thank you we appreciate the kind words too yeah yeah Thanks. we applaud you too for having the discussions Absolutely. Keep keep going. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I really appreciate that. You guys have an awesome day. Peace out. You Peace too. out. Thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Corey and Connor, the Beach Boys. These guys are really cool guys. I love their attitude. I love their philosophical approach. They don't play all this subjectivist bullshit. They don't buy into commie rhetoric. And they really understand their stuff. They've actually done their research. And look, you may not agree with all the things they say, but please educate yourself when it comes to trying to understand what this whole thing is about if you want to, uh, if you want to argue. 
And I fight, and look, with all the humility I can muster, and it's understandable, because most people that get into Bitcoin, they just want to make money. But if you really want to understand what this thing is about, read the white paper. If you have the time, get into the Satoshi emails. If you want to talk about how to, how to do this thing in line with the vision of Satoshi, which I personally think is a brilliant idea. I mean, people forget that this is not just a peer-to-peer -peer cash system. It ha follows a philosophy of economics. There is an underlying idea behind what we're trying to do here. Uh, and when you start playing around with these things too much, the, the, which the BTC community is, is doing, you start, you start fucking up the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the mechanics of Bitcoin, and it no longer becomes Bitcoin. I feel like Bitcoin Cash, granted they're changing the code, they're sticking to the vision of Satoshi. And of course, you have BTC that is fucking around with the, uh, the vision and to the point where it's no longer Bitcoin. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I want to wind this thing down. This has been a really awesome podcast, the longest I've done in a while. We're approaching two hours. Just a couple of things that uh, I wanted to, to mention. I would be uh, disappointed if I did not make reference to the amazing debate that took place not long ago. Uh, I think it was held by the Monk society or something to that something resounding that but essentially they they had a a debate featuring jordan peterson who is one of the most brilliant philosophers i think um, we've seen in a long time and uh it featured a, another guy by the name of um, michael dyson and look this guy look if anyone knows me they realize that i am not quick to to hang shit on people when it comes to a character assassination or anything like that. And I'm, I'm going to refrain from doing so. In fact, I'm, I'm even going to compliment this guy. I think he is one of the most entertaining speakers when it comes to um, ridiculous language, bombastic speech, and uh, verbose... Like, there is an art form towards saying things in so many words, in as many words as possible, but to convey as little meaning and to have as little factuality as possible. And Michael Dyson, I think, is brilliant at this. And if you actually watch the debate, I'll put a link to it, it, it shows how you can say complete and utter nonsense. Like, this guy is absolutely... This guy, fundamentally, when, when asked to address many of the questions that Jordan Peterson posed towards him, would, would speak in a way that was, was just was just <laughs> resembling someone that did not have an answer but was simply trying to impress people. Like, you know those people that constantly just use big words in order to show you how intelligent they are? I've never seen anything uh, as <laughs> as indicative of this in my entire life. So, look, highly recommend checking this guy out. Um, not, for, not for any real knowledge as such, but for for entertainment purposes, but look, I, I guess I just wanted to uh, delve into some of the concepts that were spoken of in this debate that I, I took a little issue with, one specifically with Michael Dyson, like he, when he was asked by P Jordan, Jordan Peterson in regards to how to address group justice, I mean, Jordan Peterson uh, conceded to the idea, just hypothetically, that if he is, if he does have some kind of white privilege. We do accept this social justice idea of white privilege or whatever other privilege you might have. Then how do you assign justice? How do you actually assign reparations? I mean, how are we going to definitively work out how guilty someone is of having this privilege or or even assigning reparations? I mean, when we have when we're talking about individual justice, which is how the entire legal system is predicated on, I mean, this is what the legal system is predicated on. This whole idea that we look at we look at justice on the individual level. So if you committed a crime, we hold you accountable for the consequences of your action. And we can assign responsibility to an individual for their wrongdoing. But when it comes to group justice, how do you assign responsibility for a group? I mean, if the, the white people are responsible for the actions of their ancestors, and they, or they have this white privilege, how do we assign group justice? Do we now say that that individual, even though that individual may not have done anything in of them, wrong in of themselves or even be connected ancestrally to people that have done horrible things. By merely being white, do we assign him blame and responsibility? How do we assign justice to the group? Are we going to suddenly say because, because a group has done something, in this, let's say black people start committing all of these violent rapes around the world, and I've done none of that purely because I have 
melanin now? Am I assigned responsibility? And, and now you're going to pass laws against black people because of the majority of black people doing horrible things? It doesn't work. And of course, when Michael Dyson was uh, was asked this question, how do you how do you address this? He's like, well, I believe the the complexities of the uh, the the articulation that can be manifested within my my mind can only be subverted by truth and reality. <laughs> and look, don't get me wrong. Look, I, I I realize that the guy is making some sense with the words that he is constructing, but when you actually break them down. They are illogical. They're subjectivist notions. Like all of the arguments that he made. In fact, there's this brilliant video um, of Owen, this uh, this guy. Um, I forget his name. Terrible with names. But I'll put a link to this as well. Him going down, going through the entire debate and breaking down the arguments of everyone, specifically Michael Dyson. And you realize just the stupidity of what he's saying. Once you decode all of the b bombastic language, you realize that this guy was uttering utter insanity. So, look, where is... I feel bad criticizing someone so much like that. It's it's really gross because I think Michael knew what he was doing, knew that he didn't have a real definitive answer to the questions that Peterson was posing. Therefore, it could only rely on using emotional content. And I'm a big fan of that. It's a great aspect of 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 oratory, of performing the a great speech to use emotions to speak in it. In clever language, it's beautiful. It's like painting a, a picture. You you do things to add an aesthetic to it, but it still needs to have an aspect of of truth. It needs to also have content. Martin Luther King was a great speaker because he would he would speak to the heartstrings. However, his ideas were so they were grounded in truth, not just grounded in in rhetoric. I have a dream. The my four little children will one day live it. You see, if it was Michael Dyson coming up with a speech like that, he'd be like, I believe that the manifestations of our personification can only be articulated in truth. And the whiteness of this insidious, grotesque nature of reality can only be <laughs> extrapolated in this historical ex excavation. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting carried away now. I'm being silly. But ladies and gentlemen, I really enjoyed the debate. I highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in just what's going on in society right now and the laws that are being passed in regards to uh, the, the debate was on political correctness, whether or not it's uh, it's a good thing. Um, and yeah, the uh, the against side of people who are saying political correctness is obviously a horrible idea. Um, they ended up winning, rightfully so, because political correctness is just a fancy word for trying to take away your freedoms, your individual rights. And that's definitely something that I've never I've never been down with and I never will be down with. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, um I could cover a lot of stuff, but this has been a lot long podcast, so um I want to leave it there. I want to say thank you for checking this out. Um if you guys really want to support what I do, be sure to check out my music. I'm on Spotify under Chris Shul, that's K R I S H W O L. You can check out my my EP on Spotify on iTunes. You can go to chrisshul.com. Uh I'm going to give you guys the promo video right now. Boom shakalaka. You know, people in this life will always tell you what you can and what you cannot do. You can't let nobody put limitations on yourself. You got to know that deep down inside, you got the will, you got the power, you got the fire. So if you want to go, you got to go like thunder. We'll have to beat you up the north side Bring up the rain needle in the direction Have a moment, ponder on that weakness Rise above it, keep working on that game, son I'm about to school you when I find her I'm a ring the crew, you know I got So boom shakalaka, ladies and gentlemen, that was my EP, Going Thunder Which you can check out on iTunes, Spotify On my website, chrisshield.com, you know the drill I want to leave it there, I just want to uh, announce that I do have a new song coming up uh, I have actually entered this in the uh, Art of Sedition competition. It's this um, Bitcoin revolution competition that's going on, and uh, I, I'm really excited to share this with you. I think you guys are really going to like this one. It kind of kind of deals with um, war and actually uh, makes reference to this entire revolution in regards to Bitcoin. I think it's a catchy tune. Can't wait to share it out with you. It's probably going to be a, another while before I'm able to do so. Um, I think the uh, the winners are announced in June, so we've got some time to come till then. But I look forward to sharing that that stuff with you. I want to give a shout out to the amazing people in the. Uh, the Bitcoin eco space that are uh, that attended the CoinGeek conference and have been doing some amazing stuff lately. Um, I checked out an interview uh, 
um, with Marianne. She's this, um, this beautiful creature over here that has been dropping some salient truth bombs in regards to Bitcoin Cash, pros proselytizing Bitcoin. And just over the last few months, really, she has amassed a tremendous knowledge in regards to the architecture, the philosophy, the economics of Bitcoin, and shares some of the most awesome knowledge in regards to Bitcoin. So if you have not signed up to her, be sure to do so. That's um, Tweety Bird Brain. Uh, you can check that out. Um, we got um, Rainer, I believe. I think you can see her just in the corner over here. Ain't she a lucky thing? You know, getting, getting held there by Mr. Uh, Mr. Craig Wright. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, she's been dropping some powerful knowledge in regards to Bitcoin Cash. It's great to see the ladies actually taking the lead and, and uh, promoting this thing because there are not many women in the world of crypto. So it's good to see these girls represented. Of course, we got Vin Armani in the house over here. My intellectual soul brother, the, uh, the founder of Cointex, <laughs> the, uh, the entertainer, the uh, developer, amongst many other things, the, the disseminator of wisdomatic truth bombs. And, uh, yeah, if you guys are in this picture, be sure to hit me up and let me know. We got a lot of uh, key figures in the Bitcoin Cash movement over here. Obviously, Kelvin Ayer, Craig Wright, uh, Mr. Vin Armani, and the list goes on and on and on. But, man, I wish I could have been down there. Um, next Coin Geek Conference, I'm definitely going to try to come down. I think it, they, held, they hold it every six months. I think it's a great way to, to be involved in what's going on. Uh, Vin Armani went to this conference and he spoke about how the general energy of everyone was that of, of empowerment. Rather than huddling and going to the moon, having Bitcoin go to the moon and having this whole, hey, let's make lots and lots of money. One of the things that I, I found really inspiring listening to Vin Armani speak about this conference is that everyone there is about trying to figure out how we can pave the way for empowering people to make the world a better place by bringing about economic freedom. And uh, I find this funny because you contrast, uh, Vin Armani actually made reference to this, you, you contrast just the, the general attitude of the Bitcoin Cash eco space and uh, just, just how people present themselves in comparison to the Bitcoin core eco space, the magical crypto people. And look, I don't want to say anything, but look, you guys can make up your own mind. <laughs> so look, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave it there. Peace out. Keep it real. Don't drive and text. Be sure to uh, check us out. I'm on iTunes. I'm on Spotify. Uh, I have my music, which you can also check out on iTunes and Spotify under Chris Schulitz, K-R-I-S-H-O-O-L. Uh, I'm going to stop shamelessly promoting myself and leave it there. Be sure to drop us a message and let us know what you think. Follow me. Follow the, be the Beach Boys. Follow all the other people that I've shouted out. Until next time, peace out. Keep it real. Don't drive and text. This is the Chris Schulitz Journey. Signing out. Ow! You won't make it I don't need a care Where this won't be